Excellent. So wonderful. We're broadcasting live again. Thank you everyone for being here to close out the end of the day of day one, Diana Initiative 2021 Spark a Journey. My name is Ian Meyer and I am thrilled to be here to help close out this day and bring in our next speaker. Uh, it's just been amazing. It's, it's wonderful to see all these people sharing their knowledge. But as today closes, we really need to talk about a few things. One, we need to talk about our sponsors, our incredible sponsors, such as our track sponsors that are on the screen right now that make all the tracks possible. We also need to talk about our recording sponsors. So let's say you heard this great talk and you say, oh, I wanna share this with somebody later. These are the sponsors that are helping make sure and ensure that these videos get up onto the internet, that they're available so you can check them out later, you can share them with friends and further share those messages. And then of course, all of our amazing sponsors because all of you registered, you might've registered for free. You might've registered for $5 and are getting all this content and all this interactivity. And these are some of the people making it possible. So please, 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 please go visit them in the expo hall. They got some cool stuff going on. They'll talk to you about the cool things they're doing. And we'd really appreciate it if you showed them all the love you can. So what are we gonna do tomorrow? Tomorrow, because this is the end of the day, we're gonna close it out on a great note. And, but tomorrow, 7.30 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. Pacific time, that's 10.30 a.m. Eastern time. In the networking area, there'll be a great social hour. You can go to dianainitiative.org slash social hour to find out more about that. And then the DJ chill out room from DJ Aaron starts at 8.30 a.m. on Saturday and goes to about 10, that's 11.30 a.m. Eastern time. And of course, we kick off the day, we truly kick off the day with the amazing Stephanie, Info Steph, Steph at, uh, at Steph and Sec on Twitter. And they're going to talk about you, you right there listening to the sound of my voice are the prize and how to hire the right boss and employer for a more fulfilling career. Because that's a two-way street. You want to hear what they have to say. So. If you like anything I'm saying and you like anything that you heard today, please give a huge thanks to all the volunteers, the staff, the sponsors, everyone who's been online today doing everything they can to make this an amazing experience for you. And if your pockets just happen to be itchy with money and you're like, oh, this money, I just can't handle it. I don't want it anymore. Please, please go to dianainitiative.org slash donate and slam on that donate button. Show some love that way so that next year we can deliver this incredible experience as well. If you need more information, you can always go to dianainitiative2021.sketch.com. It's also linked on the website to get more information on what's going on tomorrow. But frankly, there's been enough of me talking. Let's hear from our speaker, right? In stream with us right now, we have Suchi Pahi, and they are a data privacy and cybersecurity attorney with a passion for tech, right? We need more of those. And, and, <laughs> and, I, and I did ask beforehand, we are allowed to record because this is a privacy attorney. So, we, <laughs> you know, make sure it's good. So uh, we'll come back for Q&A afterwards and some other notes, but please, Suchi, it's a privilege to introduce you and we're really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm going to echo the hanging out for Steph's talk tomorrow morning. Um, it'll be awesome. And I think there's a common theme. And so before we dive into leaders lower the ladder, um, there's a little bit of a common theme and it's around how to pitch yourself, how to make yourself marketable, how to be the best you that you are. And, you know, you can do a lot. But when you're in a leadership and a management position, you can do even more. And when you find a sponsor, you can do even more. And so what we're going to talk about today is building and retaining diversity in the cybersecurity community. And when I say diversity, I'm talking about socioeconomic, I'm talking about ethnic, religious, gender, anything you can think of that will give us more perspectives. Uh, a little bit about myself. I'm, as Ian said, Suchi Pahi. I'm a data privacy and cybersecurity attorney. You can find me on Twitter. Uh, that's my handle. I don't really tweet about information security or cybersecurity anymore. I'll tweet a little bit about IR and then it's mostly nature, cute animals and some existential crises on like Mondays and Fridays. So if that's your thing, go ahead and hit the follow button and, and we can hang out and feel free to ask me questions about this talk or data privacy or cybersecurity law generally. I'm not your lawyer. This is not legal advice. And who is this talk for? So you who are listening, this talk is for you. It's for execs, it's for senior leadership, it's for middle management, and it's also for junior team members. Um, while you might be as a junior team member, not in a position to, from a leadership point of view, 
uh, bring more people into the community, you will also you'll actually get the skills that you need to advance your own professional development uh, during the course of this talk, and you'll be able to soon be in a middle management or senior leadership position and take the steps that I'm going to talk about today. All right. So we all know that there's a problem with diversity in the cybersecurity community. Um, but what is the big picture really like? It's one thing to see like a headline here or there or hear about it from a friend or hear about it at your company, but what is it really like in the world? And here are a few facts. So 20% of the US cybersecurity workforce was made up of women. And this was a 2019 report. 1% of senior management in cybersecurity is women. And this was a 2020 report. And only 4% of the top companies, and this is outside of cybersecurity, so just across the companies entirely uh, in the US have people of color at the C-suite level. I don't know what the breakdown is for any of the other forms of diversity, including things like neurodiversity. Um, but it's pretty shocking to take a look at these numbers and say, 1% of senior management is women in cybersecurity. That's a wild ride to me, especially when you think about how many women you see at local B-sides or tool meetups or things like that in our actual community who could be senior leadership. And the question is, why aren't they and how do we get them there? And that's something that I want you to really keep in your um, forefront of your mind as we go through the rest of this. So why should you care about diversity at all? Any kind of diversity. First and foremost, products and services will be better. And I'll give you a real life example of this. Um, actually two examples of this. So in one of the workplaces that I've worked in before, I was helping a team that was doing some marketing for a product. And the team was a group of young, white, cisgendered men. Um, there were no women on the team and there were no minorities, other minorities on the team. And they developed this um, one pager that was basically meant for end users. And it talked about women's pregnancy and you know, not having enough time to do work. And it did in a very tone deaf way that came across as both creepy and marginalizing women when they were pregnant. And no one caught it until it landed uh, several seniority levels up at my desk in my hands. And I looked at this paper and I was like, you know, uh, we're three lines in and I'm skeeved out by what we're trying to say about our particular product. And if we didn't have my perspective then, that line would have stayed in. And that's an example of just a direct impact on a product or service. And there are many of those that you'll see throughout the tech life cycle. So when someone's starting a product and taking it through their roadmap and building it and having it vetted and stuff, if you don't have the woman or by the women, I mean women <laughs> and um, people of different ethnicities and, and socioeconomic classes, then you won't have someone to spot the issues because it's just not something that's within the worldview or the environment of um, the other people who are involved. Um, another example of that is perhaps very well known. It was when Snapchat had its automatic like geolocation sharing option turned on. And a lot of folks were like, hey, uh, if we're Snapchatting people, we, we don't mean to share our geolocation with them as well. Like that's really creepy. Why is it automatically on? And most of the uproar came first from women and then a lot of uh, women's advocacy groups when who deal with like domestic violence victims. And this could have been spotted before if, again, you'd had part of that population involved in at least the product development or the product vetting. So that's the first reason you should care. The second reason is it's actually beneficial to your company financially if you have diversity within your group. So ethnically diverse companies are 35% more likely to earn above average revenue. Similarly, gender diverse groups or companies are 15% more likely to earn above average revenue. Both of these are uh, US statistics and it was a study done by McKinsey. That's a significant chunk of change. And so if just the simple act of being more inclusive and more diverse 
and helping people become part of the cybersecurity community can result in this amount of revenue increase, then as a senior or senior leader or an executive, um, there's a huge incentive and a easy pitch to make for uh, concrete targets uh, at the board level for increasing diversity and making changes to the way job offerings are written and how you handle retention of um, minority groups in your company. So number one and number two are a little bit soulless, um, I have to admit. So they're very corporate. And maybe number three, the why I should care point will hit home a little bit better for some of y'all. And that is, you want to pay it forward. Um, for those of you who are in minority groups and have made it and have succeeded, it's really helpful to have this uh, mentality of helping other people get to where you are now and um, benefiting your community overall. And, and that's something that maybe won't uh, jive for many people. Maybe it does. It's something that I personally really prefer and that's been my philosophy uh, from the get-go. If I can share the knowledge, if I can share the information, if I can help someone else also succeed, then I, I would like to do that, especially when these are opportunities that can help uh, lift your you know, friend's entire family from working a minimum wage job and really having to struggle to something that pays well, and they can afford healthcare and set their time and, and all of that stuff. Um, so I think that's really important. And that's why the title of this talk is Leaders Lower the Ladder. What I want you to think about when, when you hear that is someone at the top of like a cliff with a ladder and someone at the bottom of that cliff who wants to climb that ladder. And your options there are to just ignore that person. You can kick off the ladder. You can be a total douche. Um, or alternately, you can say, hey, why don't you check out this ladder? Here's how I got there. And I will help you along the way. And so what we're going to talk about is how you can actually be the leader who is lowering the ladder and helping people up behind them. So what do you actually do? What are more of the following three? And we'll get into them in detail soon. So the first is sponsor or mentor, be a part of community outreach or education. And the last one is practice empathy. And really it should underlay everything you do, but I have it as a separate bullet point so we can really, really talk about it and go through some examples. Um, one caveat of all of this is the best sponsors are people who are well positioned, um, high earning, and tend to be more established in their careers. That currently, because of the lack of diversity in our field, means your typical white cisgendered male, um, sometimes female, but at a much lower number. And so you may find yourself uh, feeling a little bit uncomfortable because you are trying to make a friendship or a relationship with someone that you're, you don't have a lot in common with, et cetera, et cetera. But that's part of being a sponsor and part of sponsorship. The other flip side of that is if you're part of a minority group and you're seeking to be more active in increasing diversity, there could be potential backlash um, because of implicit bias. And so these are just things to be aware of, and it's up to you to decide how much it bothers you or how much it's going to affect your next steps. And that's only for sponsorship and mentorship. So um, if you choose instead to be part of the community outreach and education, then you can do that with probably more limited backlash. Okay, so I talked about sponsorship and mentorship without actually telling you what it was. So let's get into sponsorship versus mentorship. So sponsorship is a type of mentorship that's more active. So if I was a sponsor for you, I would know about your career. I'll probably be part of your company. And I would say, um, hey, you know, Joe, have you seen Melissa's work? It's really amazing. Look at this project she just did. And I would put your work in front of Joe and be like, I couldn't have done this without her. That's a way of sponsoring my direct report or junior colleague or team member or whomever and really making you or Melissa here um, more visible in the organization than she might have been otherwise. 
So you want a sponsor to promote work contributions to others, help you navigate politics in the organization, um, assign or delegate high visibility projects that could be stretch projects. And by stretch, I mean, maybe you don't think you can do that project or lead that project, but if I'm your sponsor and I think, you know what, you're really capable, you've gotten so much other stuff done, like this project would be great for you to try to do, then I would encourage you to take that project. And then of course there's the raise the direct report for uh, promotions. And these are all things that if you're a sponsoree, you should look for uh, from a sponsor. Like if there's someone who's been inviting you to panels or giving you some of the more high visibility projects, that person is probably acting more as a sponsor than just a mentor for you. Um, and if you're a sponsor, you should use these as a way to frame your approach to uh, mentoring your direct reports or your team members or colleagues or whomever it is so that you can be that actual uh, added benefit for that person. So you can see the fruits of the work that you're doing and get that person to where you are, where you think they could be. And then we have mentorship and mentors more generally. Um, mentors are typically, mentors who aren't sponsors are typically more advisors. They provide constructive feedback to the mentees. Uh, it's a two-way relationship. It tends to be a longer relationship. And mentors can be inside the organization or outside the organization. Um, when I was in a law firm, I had been given the advice to always have a in-law firm mentor and an out of law firm mentor. And I took that advice seriously. And in the end, it made one of the biggest differences in my careers. So my in the law firm mentor helped me navigate what law firm committee I should be a part of, who should I really try to work for? Um, do people actually participate in like this firm wide event and stuff like that? And that was important for figuring out how to navigate life inside of the law firm. But I just happened to meet another attorney who, um, was an older Asian attorney out of a different office of ours at a uh, conference. And he and I hit it off. Um, he was very kind and very thoughtful and gave great advice. And when I was ready to move from the law firm and I'd express, expressed some of my reservations and why I was trying to move, he was really encouraging and gave me some advice from his own life experiences that helped me make some uh, decisions that were big changes. And so having that inside the firm mentor was great, but I couldn't go to my inside the firm mentor and say, I want to leave. This sucks. Uh, but I could do that with the outside the law firm mentor. And uh, we're still friends now. And he will sometimes call me and say, hey, I'm thinking about moving to this company. What do you think about it? What do you think about this field? Um, and he has since we met successfully transitioned from an intellectual property practice, which is like patents and IP and trademarks um, into or IP, uh, copyright trademarks into privacy and cybersecurity as well as intellectual property. And so it was a two-way relationship for us as well. So I really emphasized sponsors and this is an example of why I think sponsors are so important. So as you can see from this graphic, 119% um, of the sponsorees were more likely to have their ideas developed and 200% more likely to see their ideas implemented. These are some incredible numbers. Uh, it's not just a marginal return if you're a sponsor. You're really making a significant difference in helping a minority group or a person from a minority group um, find success in whatever industry or company you're in. And that's not to really just dig on mentorship. Mentorship is also critical. Uh, there are studies showing that folks are better prepared for promotions. They have higher success rates in their field. They have better job satisfaction, better performance, and they're more likely to stay with the company. And frequently you hear people talk about high turnover rates, oh, I trained this person and then they left, uh, and all of that stuff. But if you've built strong relationships, you can predict when a person's leaving because they're probably gonna tell you and you can also have people for a little bit longer. There will be a sense of loyalty and trust and respect, but that has to be fostered. Um, and that's part of where mentorship can play in as well. So how do you make mentorship or sponsorship work? And I originally wasn't going to include this slide, but I remembered you know, several times people are like, eh, I had a mentor, I talked to them once, I, I really didn't get anything out of it. Um, making mentorship 
or sponsorship work takes effort and knowledge from both of the people engaged in this whole thing. Um, you can have company formal mentorship programs. Those will help establish more concrete goals that the mentor and the mentee can try to meet. Maybe it's, hey, have, have meetings twice a month, someone come with you know, questions they have or have coffee once a month, whatever it is. Um, you can set these goals for the people who are participating and you'll actually start to get returns because folks will start to build relationships. Uh, there should also be a feedback and review process in that, ideally anonymous, um, in case there are some problematic pairings because not everyone has the chemistry to build a good professional relationship in a mentorship and mentee situation. Uh, there's also informal mentorship and this can be peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. Uh, an example of this is uh, my former colleague who's since moved to another company he and I would sit and we would talk about internal company um, initiatives, who's buying into what, what kind of budget we're looking at for certain products. And we'd have this exchange of information. And then he'd say something like, you know, if I was going to tee up this project, this is how I would do it. And that was a way of informal peer to peer mentoring. He didn't have to share that with me. And he wasn't sharing it out of a sense of he knew how to do it better or was smarter, but a I've seen this work for me. Maybe it can work for you. Why don't you give it a try? So peer-to-peer -peer mentoring is great. Um, and that's why I said more experienced colleagues from a company or a certain field can be really helpful for informal mentoring and sponsorship. And if you're the mentee, so for those of y'all who aren't in leadership or senior executive positions, um, when you're in a mentorship relationship, you should really try to have an idea of what questions you want to have answered and what you want out of the mentor and mentee relationship? Is it someone who you can talk to about life changes? Is it someone you can talk to about specifically your one specialty area within your field? Is it someone who can help you engage more with the broader community? Um, and is it someone who you can just call when you have a problem? So these are the types of questions you should be asking yourself so you can get the best out of that mentor and mentee relationship. Um, the corollary of that is after you've figured that out, make sure to communicate it. So whether that's in writing, whether it's over the phone, um, whether it's in person, you have to tell your mentor, hey, this is what I'm expecting from this. Does that fit your expectations of this mentee mentorship relationship? Sponsors should be proactive and open their network. Um, if you're a sponsor, you hold a lot of influence and power probably more than you think you do. And you probably know other people in your network who hold a lot of influence and power. So it's on you as the sponsor to proactively make introductions, set up one-on-ones, or set up a group of three to talk, or bring someone with you to a uh, off-site get together that you and your friends are going to, and this person could uh, benefit from that conversation and the, that relationship building. So for sponsors, it's, it's you have to be thoughtful when you're sponsoring a sponsoree so that you can be effective. Um, and last but not least, mentors should be active listeners and foster a relationship that's built on trust and respect. And we, we touched on that in the last slide, but um, active listening is gonna come back up again. So sponsorship and mentorship aside, that was the first way you could help lower the ladder. The other one is community outreach and education. So types of outreach and education include uh, giving classes. And an example of this would be, we have a local library here near my parents' home. And at the local library, the library has set up uh, basic computer skills classes for the first half of the day. That's not actually really convenient for people who have jobs uh, during the daytime or who are working multiple jobs. And so I would suggest if you're interested in teaching classes at your local school, trying to do it on the weekends or, or the local library, doing it on the weekends or doing it after hours. So like a 6 p.m. or a 7 p.m. slot so that people can make it to your classes, learn new skills and then try to build on them. And they don't have to be difficult because you are steeped in the cybersecurity industry. Your average person really doesn't know what's going on and making just a basic 101 class is making cybersecurity accessible. Similarly, if you don't have the time to prep a class and teach a class, you could do something like a guest lecture. Um, and guest lectures could be at the local community college or a trade school or 
however you want to set that up. Uh, and you can introduce a topic and explain it and see whether you spark an interest. And here we go. We're going to spark a journey in someone who's really excited or interested in what you've talked about. And guest lectures can also be just school visits at elementary or high school or middle school. And the benefit of that is having these young students who will see you and go, oh, this person really cares about this topic and they're really successful in this and they look like me and this is exciting and I, I wanna do that too. Um, it really exposes people to some other options than what they might be getting in school. And then of course, outside of those in-person, on-time uh, things in the education area for the general public, you have financial donations that you can do to different special interest groups. And, and I don't mean in the politics way. I mean like women in information security or um, I think Black Girls Hack is the one that recently a friend of mine donated uh, DEF CON tickets to. That's a great way to also uh, do outreach and education in the community to support these groups that are doing the work, have the plans. And if you don't have the time, maybe you have the money, that's the way to do it. Last but not least, conferences for non-infosec communities. Um, this one's a little bit weird maybe from the get-go, but I'll give you an example. I did a law, cyber insurance and cybersecurity presentation for the accounting groups for the state of Texas. So they're all CPAs. They have this big organization whose name escapes me right now. And I had uh, emailed someone I knew in there. And I said, hey, you know, this is actually pertinent to your industry. I just worked with a former client who was having some issues and I thought it might be helpful to do just a 101 on how you evaluate cyber insurance and what you need to be aware of from cybersecurity regs. And they were like, that sounds great. And so there I was at a non-information security talk or non-information security conference. I mean, just surrounded by accountants and they were doing stuff that I had never heard of, reading books I'd never heard of and lots of math. Um, it was very out of my world basically and gave a presentation got some really interesting questions and some interesting feedback um and really got some of these accountants that i had met to be more interested in pulling the cybersecurity side of what they need to do as accountants into their actual consulting practice so that was something that was really exciting to see and and great to help guide and it's a way to bring your knowledge base from where you are now within the cybersecurity group to adults who are in non-cybersecurity places and who can learn more and take what you're giving them and maybe eventually work their way into this field as well. I'm not sure if cybersecurity consulting is really part of the cybersecurity field. I'm leaning yes, because there are a lot of independent consultants and really uh, effective consulting groups uh, that do cybersecurity and data privacy. All right, empathy, it's in green, it's loud, <laughs> and the reason that I did this slide this way is somehow I want you to be aggressively empathetic. And that's a weird combination of words, um, but you'll get what I mean. So what is empathy? According to the Center for Creative Leadership, it's the ability to experience and relate to the thoughts, emotions, or experience of others. And if you're being empathetic, it means you're able to step outside of you and all the experiences that make you and the way you think and the way you judge people and put yourself in the shoes of another person and feel what they're feeling and understand why they're saying they're feeling the way they're feeling, which is really a soft skill um, according to all of the outdated textbooks, but it's actually one of the most integral things that you can develop and practice and engage with in your career. So steps for empathy during communications. You want to actively listen, which if you remember from earlier when I was talking about mentorship, I said mentors have to actively listen. What is active listening? It's not taking notes. It's not repeating back what someone said like a parrot. It's trying to figure out what they're actually telling you. So if I'm sitting across from a colleague and my colleague's like, oh man, you know, I'm really tired. I'm very frustrated. And this just, this project is totally disorganized. I should be, when I'm listening actively to this colleague, I should be thinking about, okay, what is he really frustrated by? What, what, 
number of situations that I know about because we work together on this project have resulted in this type of frustration. And my response might be, um, hey, well, I understand that you're frustrated because blah, blah, blah. And so that's where I'll repeat back to this person, which is step two here, what I understand that the person's feeling. And this gives that person an opportunity to say, yeah, you totally get it. Or no, that's not what I mean. And at that point, which is step three, the other person that you're talking to and try to empathetically listen and engage with will have the opportunity to tell you again what they're really feeling and eventually get to the point where you're both on the same page that person's been acknowledged and validated. And now you guys can work together on a solution, um, whatever negotiations you need to do, or, hey, you know what? Maybe someone else needs to do this project instead, or maybe you owe someone an apology. It's fine. So if you practice these four steps, and it can be with the simplest things, you'll really be able to develop that skill of empathy and being able to identify and relate to other people in a way that will help you make folks who are in your cybersecurity community or in your family circle or friend circle or whatever, wherever you practice these skills, uh, more comfortable and more loyal and more trusting and they'll respect you more and they'll be more likely to stay within the community. Um, lowering the ladder doesn't mean just giving someone the steps of how you became successful. It means helping them and understanding what their barriers might be or what their troubles might be or what their abilities might be and helping them professionally develop in a way where they can end up where you are. So you have to demonstrate empathy. Uh, you can't just verbalize that you are empathetic and stop there. Your actions should actually reflect your empathy. And I've given you the bullet points of what I basically said previously, which is you can practice empathy it is effective and it can be helpful in all of your communications or interactions with people. And that's it. So the key takeaways here are to practice empathy, be a sponsor if you can, or be a mentor, that's okay too, or engage in community education and outreach. And that's it. Awesome. Thank you so much. This is uh, amazing. I think it's a wonderful way to close out the day, to talk about aggressive empathy. And, uh, I, and some of the, so the chat went back and forth. Everyone kind of lit up a bit about the idea of aggressive empathy. So we're waiting to see, uh, <laughs> we're waiting to see uh, any questions coming in. While those are coming in, um, I, I, I love your concept. It's essentially, we, we talked beforehand about, it's, it's lifting while you climb. You know, it's understanding it's a two-way street. It's understanding that you need to be part of it and and work with with individuals to do that. Um, still looking through here to see uh, if there are any questions. But um, one of the things uh, I, I've got a few questions maybe for the for the audience sure. here. I have some <laughs> to wait for others. Okay, great. Uh, oh, here we go. T uh, Tara Roy's. Is it actually necessary to feel what they are feeling in order? to practice empathy? That's a great question. I, I don't think I mean, well, I know I don't mean that if, if Ian was to burst into tears, I don't necessarily need to feel that level of sorrow or rage or whatever it is that's causing that. But I do need to figure out, Ian's sad. Why is he sad like this? What would it feel like if someone had said or done the things that he or that happened that made him this sad? Is it something I did? Is it something I said? And, and just kind of get an idea of what world and, and headspace Ian is in and how I would feel and then go from there. Because you wanna be able to identify as closely as possible without being creepy and weird um, to what the other person is feeling so you can you can build that, that link and then actually address the problem in a way that's understandable and, and feels good to the other person, like feels like it resolves it. Because, and as someone who's incredibly intellectual, and I don't say that in a braggy way, it's like, I, I sometimes miss the feelings bubble. I, I sometimes completely screw it up. You can ask a number of people how that's gone. <laughs> so um, sometimes I struggle with that. And, and if you're able to make that active step into feelings mode, you realize that your logical answer just makes everything worse. 
And so it's better to try to do it from the emotions and empathy standpoint than, than from the logical separated standpoint. Awesome. So we got another question from one of our volunteers. I'm hope I'm pronouncing it right. Muteki, Mutiki, forgive me. Um, so how do you effectively communicate with folks in your community that resist DEI, diversity and inclusion type initiatives, and don't want to have the conversation or think it's quote, too political? Yeah, you know, I haven't really struggled with that. I've been very lucky with with having colleagues who will pick up on it and roll with it. Um, I actually used to be one of the folks who who didn't engage in uh, diversity and inclusion efforts because um, I felt like there'd be a backlash as a Indian woman in my field. And the reason I was able to step out of that was because there was a colleague I had who was very quiet. He was a white cisgender dude, um, grew up privileged, all of that stuff. But he would go to all of these uh, DEI initiatives. He would show up, he'd have the swag. He always made an appearance. He didn't require his team members to show up with him, but just by setting that example, like I'm gonna do it this way. I'm not gonna use this kind of language. I'm gonna do blah, blah, blah. He really lived the um, ally life and that got people to come do stuff that he would do. So he you know, got entire groups and teams and departments from our company to be present at like the uh, black inclusivity group that we had. So that's wonderful. Yeah, no, it's it's you, you really have to be part of the solution, right? You you I, and it speaks exactly to your uh, aggressive empathy, you have to aggressively tackle the problem, you have to say, I'm going to go and put myself out there, I'm going to try yeah. and learn, I'm going to try and open my mind and go from there. Uh, Nicole put a great book inside of there. So if, if uh, Nicole, if you want to throw that book up onto the screen as well on the comment there. Yeah. Um, so Penguin Random House, but we can't talk about that at work by Mary Frances Winter. So if you're having that problem, uh, Nicole recommends that book to how you broach those types of challenges. And that was actually great, which is one of my questions. So great. Steve Christie Collie, Sushi Dude, Question, how can you, uh, how can people in individual contributor IC positions become mentors or sponsors? Most of the advice I've seen assumes that you're in a leadership position. So if you're a peer or you're in, in those individual contributor positions, what would you suggest? Yeah, um, I have an example and I think extrapolate from it what you will. Uh, one of our security, junior security analysts, and this was at my prior company, wanted to, he was learning some new skill set, and it was really complicated and studying for an exam. And um, he had said to the other security analyst he was working with that he was like, man, you know, this is really hard. I've been spending, I've been spending a lot of time with this and I can't get anywhere. And what they did was they set up a weekly um, hour long group, like office hour type thing, but they all worked on the same project with him to try to help him understand and learn it. They were all just security analysts. None of them manage other people. They weren't people managers. Um, he passed whatever exam that was. Everyone learned something new. They they ended up becoming really good friends and were a really good team. And and I thought that was a great way to uh, mentor someone and 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 help them. And even somewhat of a sponsorship thing because it was providing him with resources that he otherwise didn't think to look at or would have had access to. Sure, you know, that is something that a lot of people don't realize. You, you don't have to be the leader. You don't have to be that person who can sponsor them going to a conference or a panel or whatnot. Uh, building that relationship uh, with your peers, sharing your knowledge and whatnot, uh, that's great. Um, it, to that point, kind of one of my questions was, uh, there's a trend recently to say, you need a mentor that's above you that can help guide you. And as much as you're mentoring someone who maybe is coming to you with experience, having someone who's generationally different, not just, you know, maybe a position behind you, but maybe you're, you know, 20 years into your career and they're a student and you can learn from them much about the new workforce coming in. How do you feel about that from a mentorship perspective? I, I have benefited a lot from mentors who are uh, at least one generation uh, above me. And it's because there is a level of strategy and world know-how that they have from their experiences that I don't have, whether I'm good at my job or not, or, or, or a technical expert in the field or not, because there's a lot of um, 
reading the currents of like corporate politics and things like that, even if you're an individual contributor um, that you have to be able to do. And you can get a jump on that by talking to colleagues who've been at companies for the last, you know, 60 something years. Um, they, they just have a really good way of sussing out what's real and what isn't. So I like that. I think intergenerational mentorship is really important and it works both ways. Um, that one colleague who was super active in, in uh, diversity and inclusivity stuff, uh, he helped one of our other colleagues figure out how to use Google Drive, which is all we were using. So. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, no, uh, it's, and I, I, I love that. And uh, we, we've actually had some staff discussions about TikTok. Oh, here was, a, here was a great question. So Kevin, volunteer. So question, is there something you recommend to mentees to be more coachable? Oh, that's a great question. What, what can someone do to make themselves kind of that ideal mentee? Um, from a mentor perspective, an ideal mentee or someone who's more coachable is someone who can come to me proactively and say, hey, I, I want to set up a call. Can we talk about X, Y, Z? And then actually follow through on that. Um, and be forgiving when your mentors may not make an appointment or something like that or not be responsive. Ping them again. Um, be that active person who's following up over and over again. And then actually take the advice you're given. And if you're not taking the advice you're given, have a fully thought out reason for, you know, why that advice doesn't really fit. And it's a conversation you can have. Like if you've set up a good mentor relationship or are setting up a good mentor relationship, it should be a, a conversation where you can say, you know, that that doesn't really sound like it applies. And, and here's why I'm thinking it might not apply. What do you think about this? And and work that out in a conversation with your mentor. And I think that's what is uh, coachable. It's like the openness, uh, the willing to pursue, and then the willingness to actually take the advice. I like that. I, it's you don't have to always take the advice, but you should let your mentor know why, you know, so they don't say, all right, well, I'm trying to help you and you're not, you're not listening. So what am I spending my time for? And they go, oh, you know, I didn't, I didn't have that perspective. I didn't know that about your background. I didn't know that about, you know, what you want to do. Let's take a different route. I, I love that. Um, on that same note, while we wait to see if uh, some other questions pop up here, and then uh, we'll probably start to wrap up here. Um, so, on that same note, we talked about how if you're not a leader in an organization, how you can, uh, you know, do peer mentoring. But let's say you are a leader in an organization. How do you, the best way, how do you let people know that you're open to that? You know, what is, is it groups inside your organization? Is it those diversity and diversity and inclusion groups? Uh, what would you suggest to kind of put the word out there that I'm, I, I would like to help? I'd like to grow someone. Yeah, I would, I think I would have a two part approach. One would be actually telling people that I'm interested in having a mentee, someone I work with. The other would be if I have one on ones or small group chats, it would be actually being active in those small one on ones and group chats um, and making yourself available. Hey, here's my number. Call me if you need anything, that kind of stuff. Um, call me if you have any questions about this, whatever work item, like making yourself accessible and uh, really showing your personality as a collegial, helpful person goes a, a, a long way for leaders to be more approachable in, in real life for mentees. And then I think the other way is to, um, other than communicating verbally all of these things, it's to actually actively do stuff. So if you're a leader and you're saying you're invested in, in diversity and inclusion and in building out the community, then you should be setting, setting solid metrics for your uh, C-level folks or your board and saying, we need to hit this uh, threshold for hires from particular groups, or we need to try to hit it, or we need to have our outside recruiters um, make sure they're surfacing resumes from people with, uh, I don't know, funky names or something like that. And I say funky names because I'm thinking Western centric, sure. but you know, um, you have to put in these like measurable things that show that you're trying to actually make a difference with the power that you have. And then also, um, show up to those diversity and inclusion events, like show up, be active, be loudly supportive. If you are physically there or virtually there, then I can say, oh, this person's not just um, blowing smoke up someone's ass. They're actually going to be there. So 
Yeah, no, if you have privilege, it is your privilege and your requirement to use that privilege to, to lift the next person. I, I couldn't agree more. Great. Are there example checklists, Nicole, are there example checklists for figuring out a mentorship relationship, something you can kind of go through and get to know each other? You know, I, I think approaching a mentorship relationship is much like approaching any other relationship. So if you see a red flag, don't keep hanging out with that mentor. And I mean, someone who like negates the way you say you're feeling, someone who negates your reality, someone who's gaslighting you, like that kind of stuff. That's not the relationship you wanna be in. Um, so that's for mentor and mentees. Typically your ideal mentor is that sponsor level person. And if this person says that they're your mentor or they're really supporting you, but they're not helping you take the stretch projects, they're not really building you up and they're not putting you in front of the right people, then you need to stop putting energy there and go to um, develop a relationship with someone else who can do it better for you and who understands your goals. Love that. No, absolutely. There was one note, and uh, we'll put this out here at this point. If there are any other questions or uh, things that anyone would like to bring up, please put them in now. Uh, I'll bring up one uh, additional thought to kind of maybe have you expound on it because I, I loved what you said. You were talking about sitting with your mentor and having them share with you, this is what people are talking about. This is what this person likes. This is what they're, I think the phrase you used was bought into. And I put in the chat, I'm like, that cannot be understated. Having someone who's in the meetings that you're not, that has relationships that you don't saying, if you present it this way, you will be successful. If you present it this way, it will crash and burn because what you don't understand is the history. Uh, it, it, was I reading that right? Is that as important as I feel it is? It is 100% important. And it is just as important as you think it is. Um, all of the successful navigations I've done for like institution wide changes, or even the simplest things have relied on historical knowledge that I didn't have and that someone was willing to share. And that makes all all of the difference like, hey, why is so and so checked out? Well, they're moving to another startup in two weeks. And so that's not where you want to spend your energy. You need to talk to so-and-so who's going to be taking over. Well, if I didn't know that, um, I would have just spent a bunch of time with so-and-so who's leaving, but instead I was able to reorient and, and build an initiative with someone else. And that's the critical information when you're working inside of a, a workplace. Excellent. So I think that is probably a great place. And I don't see any more questions in here. Um, oh, wait, hold on. Uh, Okay, uh, that wasn't a question. Okay, very good. So I'm going to put into uh, the chat some links for everyone that we'll go through here just real quick. Um, uh, Suji, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you for coming on, spending your time educating us and sharing, you know, your perspective and background on on this topic that is so important, you know, building those relationships. Uh, I'll probably be like doing some wrestler voice later where I'm like, aggressive <laughs> empathy, oh yeah, you know, and, and yeah, I, I feel you. Uh, so <laughs> that said, that brings an end to day one of the Diana Initiative 2021. Uh, spark a journey in the links inside of the chat here. Please make sure to come check out uh, the networking social hour that starts at 7.30 a.m. tomorrow morning, Pacific time, 10.30 a.m. Uh, Eastern time. I put Pacific time in there for whatever reason. Uh, there's also information in there uh, about uh, the social hour. Uh, also, the DJ and DJ Aaron starts at 8.30 Pacific time as well. Make sure to check that out in the chill out room. And then the big portion kicks off with info staff, staff on security at 8.30 Pacific time, 11.30 a.m. Uh, with their talk on uh, you are the prize. You, you listening right now, sticking around, you're the prize. And we're happy you're here. And thank you for tuning in. And we hope to see you tomorrow morning. Suchi, again, thank you. Yeah. And that brings us to a close. Everyone have a great night and be well.